and the printers are ready to go ahead and put out the tshuva of the Ramah, they see it and they realize, you know what, this, this is too lenient. This, this is not something that the masses could deal with. So they just yank out that tshuva. They yank it out. So then they have to adjust the numbers because tshuva 124 is just <laughs> lost. So they make tshuva 125 into 124. So therefore, when anyone has to deal with the tshuvas of the Ramah and they open up the Amsterdam edition, uh, you know, it's perplexing. And as a result of it, there are people, there were rabbinic authorities, that when they heard from others that the Ramah once gave a way of defending such a practice, so they claimed, you should know, I, it is not true. He never allowed such a thing, because to prove it to you, I have in my, my answer as far, I have on my bookshelf, the Amsterdam, reliable Amsterdam edition, and the tshuva is not there. From the fact that the tshuva is not there, obviously he never wrote it. This is a way of thinking into the 19th century. And even the Chayadam says, listen, it's a questionable tshuva. In other words, because someone, a printer in Amsterdam, decides to take it out. So it's always fascinating to me. This is Amsterdam. They're interacting with society. Uh, they're becoming more open, right? It, it, it's what's fascinating to me even more. I was once doing research on uh, ksuvis, ktuba. Ktuba, we all have, or many of us have, uh, artists that uh, we would either hire or a copy of it. There are people who have beautiful ktubot. Beautiful ktubot is not new. So they had it in Amsterdam as well, in the 16th, 17th, 18th century. So I'm looking at some ktubot. They had them online in, in one of these uh, <coughs> museums. And I realized that the paintings on the ktubot are, are ones that are extremely problematic, ones that my new filter would not allow through to reach my laptop. Extremely, extremely problematic, and I will not get into details. And I'm saying to myself, Give out, and I look at the Rabbonim, so I look at the signatures of the Rabbonim who were at the wedding, and these were well-respected Rabbonim. What, what's happening there? Did they fold it beforehand that the Rav shouldn't see it? I'm trying to figure out, so this is Amsterdam, so you have a little bit of an openness, I'm not saying that it's kosher, but it was an openness that existed in Amsterdam. So you think, ah, Amsterdam, modern community, right? And at the same time you find the greatest Zealots, and how do we, the answer is that this is not a contradiction. That's how things work. When you have shifts in one direction, you can have a movement in the other direction. Now, those that claim, you know, over the past a few years, we've had, unfortunately, from Eretz Yisrael, many stories of these ridiculous, crazy zealots. <coughs> you know, Bet Shemesh, you remember the stories? So you say to yourself, Oive, is this indicating that Israel, that the Haredi community in Israel are, are all becoming crazy? Of course not. It actually is a sign that there's a nice chunk of the Haredi community that are interacting more with society. There are options of them to go to the army. There are new options when it comes to the workplace. And the old school is getting a little bit nervous. So it actually, when you see zealots coming out, it is a sign that there is a movement in a direction that could be beneficial for Kiddush Hashem. This is something that you have to keep in mind. And that's how you can <coughs> understand the London in the 1720 that the Yaivetz is dealing with. The coffee house is the challenge, because we interact with society. We have to be strong enough to stick to our guns, to stick to our tradition, to value what Torah is about, to value what Klal Israel is about, even when we interact, even when we drink, as Howard Schultz called the coffee, Howard Schultz, CEO of Starbucks, he called coffee the beverage of truth. The beverage of truth. Why is it the beverage of truth? The enlightenment. There are those that argue that the coffee was really the product that brought the Industrial Revolution and the Age of Enlightenment into Europe. Because the beverage of choice in the 16th century in Europe, for the European who woke up, woke up and needed a good drink at 10 a.m., was a big glass of ale. So you're not going to have an Age of Enlightenment <coughs> if all of Europe is drunk. That's not going to be conducive to work heavy equipment in the Industrial Revolution if you can't walk the straight line. On the other hand, as coffee houses are popping up, in the first coffee house in England is in Oxford in 1650. By the way, you know who gets the credit? A Jew. A Jew by the name of Jacob. I have no relationship <coughs> to Yaakov Emdi. That's what I say. A Jew by the name of Jacob opens the first coffee house in Oxford which is always fascinating to see the relationship with the Jew has is something that was uh, say, played such a significant role in, in the identity of, of Europe during that period. Europe enters in its, its, its 
the era of enlightenment on the back of this wonderful beverage, uh, what we could learn from it perhaps is the fact that number one, great Gdole Yisrael utilized it. Side is something that we could use, utilize, appreciate, enhance our Yom Tif, or enhance our day, enhance our tefillah, according to the Prechadosh, enhance our Kabbalistic prance practices, according to Zakuto. <coughs> and at the same time, it is something we can sense that Gdole Yisrael had this sensitivity, that a practice that people have, like visiting a Starbucks, is something that we are not going to go ahead and challenge, but rather defend, even if there would be a shaila, and how much more so if there is absolutely no question that the products that we have on our table here, and the products that so many of us are going to enjoy tomorrow morning, are ones that are kosher le mehadrin. Enjoy them, and thank the Rabbanu Shalom for this wonderful gift that he gave wisdom to the goats to take a bite <laughs> from those red <laughs> cherries and to have a little bit of a dance and we can enjoy a uh, beverage uh, for many years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you to the sponsor. Thank you for everyone that has come out on a cold night to discuss a warm, wonderful beverage. Uh, th a special thank you to Pesa Foreman for arranging this series. I uh, hopefully we were able to address a few issues, hopefully even learn something, and hopefully uh, appreciate the fact that we have a tradition that addresses all issues, all times, all eras. And uh, for me, this was an enjoyable topic because as someone that enjoys the product of coffee, when you see the history in it and the effect it had and the approach that rabbinic authorities had, and there's so much more, by the way. There are discussions from Egypt. But I'm going to end with one tshuva. I'm going to end with one tshuva because I did bring out the tshuva from, I, I promise you, 16th century, right, uh, Vaz? 17th century, I talked about Zakuta. I did the 18th century, like the Shmus Yaakov, 19th century, the Sofer brothers. I've talked about the 20th century, the Chalkas Yaakov and the DP camps. But I didn't present you to you yet a uh, 21st century. So I'm going to end with the 21st century, and then I'll hand over the mic to you. This was a Shaila that was asked by a OU Mashgiach, who spends hours on the road, to Reb Herschel Shechter. Rosh Hashiv and Wayu, one that we have the privilege of welcoming every single year. Bosek, I always uh, appreciate. And the question was, there are times a mashgiach nosea barechev shalom. He's driving his car, the mashgiach. And he's concerned that he might fall asleep. So he wants to wake up. So hu rotzel ishtot kafe. But the problem is, he doesn't have a coffee in his car. There's a cup holder there, but it's not full. So he wants to likanes lechanut bilti kshera. He wants to enter into a non-kosher restaurant. In parentheses, in the tshuva, mem yud kuf, dalet alef nun ayin lamet dal tzach, McDonald's. McDonald's. So he wants to buy a coffee. Says Rav Hesher Shechter, al pip shuto. In other words, there's no question, this is simple. Eina nochon la mashgiach la hachmir. A mashgiach should not be strict. It's wrong. And he should act with midas chasidus. He should not go beyond the law. Because the Torah warns us, Venishmartem me'ol l'nafshol seichem. If you're afraid you're going to fall asleep, you have a mitzvah to drink a cup of coffee. And therefore, he notes, it's, if he thinks that he is more righteous by avoiding the cup of coffee, such chasidus, such righteousness, tichoshev ke chasidus shel shtus. It is foolishness, not righteousness. When you need your cup of coffee, get your cup of coffee even in McDonald's. So if someone asks you what rabbi allowed you to enter into McDonald's, it's signed by Reb Tzvi, Reb Heschel, Chef. A fascinating psaac, and one with a clear attitude, and enjoy your coffee, even though McDonald's is not as good as second cup of Starbucks. <laughs> Rabbi uh, Malevsky will be here if anyone has any questions. Um, I do want to thank um, um, Rabbi Malevsky. It's, uh, it's three weeks in a row. Um, the, the general rule of wisdom, if you're going to spend an hour get, delivering a lecture, it takes a few hours to prepare for it. So um, there was a lot of preparation in, and uh, I think a lot of my, speaking for myself, I enjoyed it. 
and speaking for you, I'm sure you did as well. So I appreciate it.